extend a welcome to those of you who have come to observe. And we hope that you not only observe, but also participate. If there are any questions you would like to ask, please feel free to throw them at me, and I'll do my best to field them. Today, I thought we might pursue our study of the poetry of Liam McTeague. McTeague, one of the finest of moderns, was unfortunately known by the general public for his drinking habits and for his exquisite poetry. Although, in fairness, he has done his fair share in projecting this image. Uh, as for example, when asked by the BBC to read the following poem, he somewhat fell under the influence of the grape and completely rewrote it and was cut off right in the middle. But uh, enough of that. Uh, here is a more watered down version of that poem. It is called Life, Death, and a Small Installment Dew. Kickingly, pantingly, scrawlingly, outwardly thrusting, in pain and shock and disbelief, hopingly, graspingly, aspiringly, trustfully demanding, through all pre recorded, synchronized and sealed, impermanently and permanent, yet stripingly, sparingly, clingingly, scheming and striving, through moment, millions of monuments, marbles and milestones, negating the ultimate, all interest canceled, repossessed. Liverpool, 1956. Well, that last part's clear. Did you want to comment, Mr. Uh, this is your father, isn't it, Molly? Yes, Mr. Ritz. Did you want to comment, Mr. Michelson? Uh, no, not particularly. Well, did the poem have any impact? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. I see. Any other comments? Mr. Michelson, I can't help but feel that you did have something to say, <coughs> and I wish you wouldn't feel inhibited. Just feel free to speak. For example, what image did the poem suggest to you, if any? Well, it suggested the image of a fellow having quite a bit of trouble in the Household Finance Corporation. Am I on the right track? I'm not sure McTeague has ever been evaluated in such practical, everyday terms. Yeah, well, I'm not a very good judge of this sort of thing. I believe it was Bernard Shaw who said, every man should be a poet at 21, and every man who's still a poet at 30 is a first-class fool. <laughs> well, as I recall, Shaw said something about the socialists. Oh, no, Shaw was a socialist to the end. He said that about poets. How old is this McTeague, anyway? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'll have to look that up. Daddy, Daddy, Miss Hibbets writes poetry. Wow, well, old is she? Old enough to flunk me. Gee, I'm sorry, honey. Why didn't you say anything? Who would have thought you'd get in a fight with my professor? Oh, uh, Miss Hibbets. Yes. Don't bother looking that up. As I recall, you were quite right. Shaw did say that about the socialists, not the poets. Okay. Thank you. I think I fixed that. Yes. Molly, if there are any comments in which you would like to share, I wish you wouldn't hold them within the bosom of the family, but would let us all hear them. Well, I don't really have any comments. Oh? Matigue has no impact on you whatsoever? Well, frankly, I find Matigue empty. Well, perhaps that's what he wants you to feel. But I just don't feel anything. In every one of his poems, at least the ones I've read, he seems so utterly futile, as if life were just an intermission between two shocking events, birth and death. Which is why I suppose he's always drinking or rotting or throwing his life away or whatever. He seems so preoccupied by the fact that after the day we're born, we're just rushing towards death. Life is full of so many beautiful things, which he ignores entirely. In other words, I am in complete agreement with the previous speaker. <laughs> 